Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our program, China's Influence on the Pacific Islands, a conversation with Daniel Sudani of the Solomon Islands. Please welcome Andrew Harding, Research Assistant in the Heritage Foundation's Asian Study Center. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here today, and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. An especially warm welcome to all of those who brave the rain to be here. And thank you for all joining us online. Today, we have a special event this morning, historic even. An opportunity to hear from Daniel Sudani, the former premier of Malaita province, the most populous province in the Solomon Islands. Mr. Sudani served as premier of Malaita province from June 2019 to February 2023. During that time, the Solomon Islands switched diplomatic recognition from Taiwan to the People's Republic of China. It also agreed to the deepest security agreement in the Pacific Islands with the People's Republic of China, including a provision for the PLA to land troops on Solomon soil if necessary. And concerns have been growing for years, both within the region and in Washington, about China's influence in the region. Not everyone in the Solomon Islands have welcomed these decisions. Daniel Sudani has put himself in China's crosshairs by standing firm for democratic principles in the face of Chinese aggression, and by questioning the government's decision to switch recognition to the PRC. For these views, the government recently ousted him from his elected seat in, Malaita, in the Malaita Provincial Assembly. We look forward to Mr. Sudani's insights as a first-hand observer to one of the most important diplomatic, political, and security threats in the Indo-Pacific, the region of the Pacific Islands. To moderate this discussion, Jeff Smith will be the, the director of the Heritage Foundation's Asian Studies Center. Please join me in welcome Daniel Sudani and Jeff Smith to the stage. We'll have him sit in this chair here. Yes. Yes, perfect. Yes. Thank you for that introduction, Andrew, and thank you to everyone for joining us in the auditorium today and, and at home. Um, this is a special event and a special conversation that I've been look, personally looking forward to for some time now. I think... Um, there may be more interest and activity on the Pacific Islands the last few months than I've seen in the previous 15 years of being in Washington. Part of that is because uh, we are in the process of renewing uh, COFA agreements with three Pacific Island countries now, uh, but also because um, China's activities in the Pacific Islands have been picking up of late, including signing a security pact in the Solomon Islands, uh, among other things that have caught our attention. Very interested to do a bit of a deeper dive so that we can understand more of what China has been doing in the Solomon Islands and the Pacific Islands more broadly. But before we get into that, um, Mr. Sudani, I thought maybe you could begin just with um, a brief discussion about your background and, and the Malaita province that you come from to help uh, educate our audience. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, everyone, and good morning. Uh, thank you for this, the Heritage Foundation for allowing us to space this morning to come and talk to the people that we share the same views. And also thank you for those who are making the trip possible for coming here, the congressman uh, who wrote the letter to, to make my visa possible for me to come. And America is a very special place and it's good to be here. I am a teacher by provision in the elementary school before I become the member of the provincial assembly. And uh, I was voted in 2019 to become the Provincial member of the people of Fataleka, Baigu. It's a ward in the province of Malaita. And Malaita is one of the provinces of Solomon Islands. Solomon Islands is made up of nine provinces. 
and one of the provinces I came from is called Malaita. And uh, I was voted in as a member of the provincial assembly and become the premier as well that same year, 2019. So that is a bit of background from me as who I am back in my country, Solomon Islands. Mm. Thank you. And so just to review the timeline, so you were elected premier of Malaita province in summer of 2019. Shortly after that, around September of 2019, the Solomon Islands government switches recognition from Taiwan to the People's Republic of China. Shortly after that, within a few weeks, you issue a moratorium to say that no PRC, CCP companies will be allowed to do business in Malaita. Within a few years, the new national government in Solomon Islands signs a security pact with the PRC, probably the first in the region to sign a security pact with the PRC. And then in February of this year, you're ousted in a no confidence vote because of your refusal to recognize the one China policy, to recognize the PRC. So you may be, as far as I'm aware, the first member of a democratic assembly to be ousted for not recognizing the PRC. So having had a front row seat to all of this activity, do you, could you give us a few anecdotes about what you're witnessing on the ground with China's growing presence in the Solomon Islands? And what is it that concerned you so much that you felt the need to push for a moratorium? I've been the premier for the last three years. When I come into the office, we, in terms of uh, the developments that has been happening in the provinces, we have been seeing nothing that the developments have been doing in, in, in the lives of the people in my province, like the Chinese involvement in logging industries. So we come up with the Aoki communique upon uh, these reasons. One is the idea of the ideology of atheist being the province of Malita Christian people. And we, like, look at the, the, the atheist. They will be, you know, they have the, the different values and the principles and beliefs that we, we cannot match with them. So uh, being a representative of the people, uh, the people say we, we should not be having these people in our province because they share a different value at all. They are not Christian people. That's one of the reasons for the Aoi Communique. And the second one is that we are trying to, to do away with Chinese companies, uh, the CCP companies' involvement in the province. Looking at this destructive development so far, this all, the market is for China and the logging industry is destructive all, all the way back in the 40 years back from, from today. So we haven't seen anything good. They left destroyed environments, so many bad things in the province, so the, the people are not happy. So we set up this moratorium and we've seen the effect of it, that we see local people coming up doing retailing because of the space that has been left for them in the province. Mm -hmm. So they can come up with uh, the businesses even to the stage of them being running shipping companies. So that, in my view, I see that standing for our people will make them you know, become strong in their own place. And would you say this is why you opposed the government's decision to switch recognition from Taiwan to the PRC? Could you explain a little more about your thinking? And um, I'm sure that you faced a lot of opposition and you have faced consequences for taking a stand uh, on this question. Can you maybe talk to us a little bit more about how that decision played out? Like the switch from ROC, the Taiwan, Taiwan government, and the, to the PRC, uh, we've seen that as an act that should not be happening with the, with the government because we, we expect them to come with some sort of a referendum to get the people know about the whole thing, because uh, we viewed it as something that will come and be part of our life in the future. So people need to be aware of 
the way they, the, the, the CCP is dealing with the development in our, in our country. So that is not the case. Uh, they make the switch without uh, the people know uh, that this is going to happen. And we expect that during the national general campaign, the government should have, the candidate should have, you know, come with know, knowing the, getting to people to know that we, we, after this government come into power, we'll have a switch so that people can know exactly what, and they will be prepared uh, to do other things in terms of when the switch happened. Mm. Because we think that the idea that we're going to pay for during the election through our pilot papers, we, we need to know. And we must agree before giving them the mandate mm. uh, in power. But the issue of switch has not been the case. So uh, my people didn't agree with the switch. Mm -hmm. So they said that uh, uh, the Malita provincial government will remain as a government under the national government, but will not accept anything from the CCP at the moment because we are not prepared. We don't have the safeguards to safeguard our people in terms of, uh, you know, <coughs> with the CCP government coming to the province. And so you essentially, you don't believe that the government consulted with the people um, or or gained the mandate or legitimacy to make such a, a switch. They essentially made the switch on their own and then tried to force it down on the rest of the provinces. And, and you've been resisting that. Um, can you tell me a bit about the your current status? Um, you were ousted in a no confidence vote, but I understand you're challenging that decision through legal means. Um, are you hoping to be able to return to your your assembly seat with the lawsuit? Definitely, uh, I'm, I'm uh, just believe strongly believe because of uh, uh, the act of disqualifying me or canceling my seat uh, in the provincial government act that I've known of. Uh, there is nothing that involves a minister of the central government in his power to give the disqualification letter to me because I was voted by the people and I was mandated by my people and it would be right for me to go out from that seat by my people, not the minister uh, of, the, of the national government. So in that, in that, in that view, I'm hoping to get my, uh, my seat back after uh, the court case that have been filed uh, for the High Court to see and give decision on the matter. Mm -hmm. And have you noticed since the security agreement and the new government came to power that more members of the assembly are suddenly adopting very pro-China positions? Um, has, has China's influence been impacting the decisions <coughs> being made at the national assembly level? Yes. Uh, they do, because uh, when we were in the executive government, they paid uh, six members of my, my executive government to resign from my government when I was in Brisbane. And uh, that was uh, the, the truth about they've been involved in the provincial matters. So they paid the, they give money, they mean give money to the members of the assembly to resign from my government. but it's. I am so lucky that I can replace the six at the same time with the opposition group that believe in what I stand for. Hmm. So I believe there's this influence that the, the CCP through the national government has been doing uh, to disturb my government. So the, the, the PRC, it seems, paid money to provincial assembly members to resign in order to hurt you, and you were able to counteract that move at least. At the moment, uh, the influence of the PRC normally comes with the, the, the cronies of the national government. National. Yeah, so they, you, you cannot really uh, figure out, but we can see that this money comes from CCP because of uh, they are going for the CCP's interest. Mm -hmm. So that, in my mind, I, I, I just understand that the, all this influence comes from the CCP through the DCGA. Mm -hmm. Now, at, at the same time that you uh, banned CCP money 
and projects in Malaita, you did say you opened uh, the doors to Amer a greater American presence, American aid, American development projects. Um, how is that received by your constituents? Are they generally more open to the United States and wishing greater interaction with the US? The people uh, in the constituents in Mali, the province as a whole, they are very happy about the USAID scale, which is now in the province of Mali. And if not, it's the first time uh, a bigger country like the US comes straight to the province through a platform under the NGOs of the United States of America called Windrock. And people are very happy because they meaningfully engage properly with their, their resources through the funding at 25 million US that has been funded to the Malita provincial mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. But it does seem to me just from hearing your story and the more I learn about it, the more it strikes me that that diplomatically the US has not been very present and very active in some of these uh, sh shenanigans that have been taking place over the past few years. Do you wish to see more US engagement uh, with the Solomon Islands? And as this sort of political turmoil is playing out, how can the US government be helpful in either stabilizing the situation or promoting democratic values and principles or ensuring that undemocratic practices uh, are, are not taking hold at the CCP's behest? I've got three reasons uh, three, three reasons to, 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 to share here. One is the issue of elections that has been uh, the bedrock of any nation. Uh, the government has extended the election for a course of sport, a Pacific game. Uh, and they said that because we have the Pacific Games 2023, uh, we, we, we need to move or extend the election to 2024. And that is one of the saddest things uh, we have he heard and learned of because of the election is much more bigger and it's a foundation of democracy to any country. And it's very sad to see that the government is extending the election for the course of games. And we would like to see the US in any way possible to get this narrative to the Solomon government that we need to have election before sports. This is one of the, the important things that should be happening in, 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 in the country of Solomon Islands in terms of the democracy beliefs and the, the, the way CCP influenced the government to have the sport. Because we have seen, the, by the time they hand the, the, the infrastructure to the people of Solomon Island, it will going to be a huge thing. Uh, and people will see that this is China. This is how China do things much faster than the US. So they seems to think that election is something not important. So we are waiting for the election to be the most important thing to happen than sports. That's one. Secondly, the absence of the US, uh, like we have seen, we, we have the belief in democracy. And the people keep, keep asking, but where is US? Where is the US, United States? Because we have seen Chinese people here. We've seen noodles and all stuff of food that been imported from China. But the people back in the country still have the belief because of uh, the relationship in back, way back in 1942, where the Americans uh, were held by Malitans who fought in the war. And when we see the parliamentary house in Solomon Islands, we think of US, because they are the one building the place, uh, the parliamentary house. And uh, now that the USH scale is there in, the, in Malita province, we think it's good for the US people to, to have a platform that connects with the Solomon Island people. It's a people to people, so that we can see effectively how things uh, be happening, because we have been uh, seeing this government to government issues and nothing happened. We are feeding a government that is not good for the people. So is there any way that we can have another different ways of 
allowing the help from the United States to the people of Solomon Islands, that would be a good idea. Hmm. <coughs> now, I'm very, um, I think it's very fortunate that you were able to make this trip to the U.S. Uh, I think you're here this week and, and next week as well, and you're able to tell some of your story um, to think tanks like us, to members of Congress. Um, are you fearful of what will happen when you return to the Solomon Islands? It does seem that the federal government and the current prime minister are very much at odds with your position and with the support of the CCP and others have been targeting you. Um, are you fearful for your future? Definitely. Uh, when I was back in the Solomon Island, we have seen this news in, news in papers talking about putting Sweden in the front page of Solomon Star and Island Sun, that the sacred thing is now become known to people. Sweden is arranging a hit squad to kill Sogovare. And all those things, you know, give me a, a, a very big, like I'm very fearful of these informations always uh, in the front page of the Solomon Star News. So going back to the Solomon Islands is not easy. Uh, we believe they will try their very best to find ways to arrest us, both of us, because of uh, the way we are here in the U.S. and with the medias that we have been now uh, communicating and advocating our rights and the principles of democracy will something that CCB will will not like to hear. Yeah. So how much that we are here, when we go back, it will be much more difficult for us than we were in the Solomons and the news, is, the news that happened in newspapers are still not, not, not been heavy or been think of very strongly in the minds of politicians, those who want to keep the positions. Mm. But uh, we are so frightened to go back. Mm. And, uh, but we have no choice. We must go back to fight for the right for our people. Hmm. Have other countries in the region, have you noticed similar Chinese activities, either from a negative perspective, or have, have any other of your regional partners been helpful? Um, I know Australia often has an influential role in the Pacific Islands. Um, have they, in this case, been helpful, or have, have they not been uh, supporting your efforts? From the creation of as a premier, what I've seen, the, the behavior, behavior of the, the partners that have been working closely with Solomon and the government, they always, you know, uh, seems to believe this bilateral thing between uh, government to government. And in many cases, that really affects the people by pressing them down for standing for their right because of like now we have the Chinese police advisors in the country, and they are, you know, asking the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to order guns to look after the infrastructures. But it is so lucky that this news, you know, exposed before doing it, so ending up the government don't allow it. Mm -hmm. But the issue of getting replica guns into the country and all these things, it's like aiding, aiding the 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 countries that we have friends to, like aiding them to keep the people's voice down. Uh, at the moment, we we hardly talk out, or you, you cannot speak for your right because when you speak against the one China policy or things that the government wants, you will be you will be arrested. Mm -hmm. So this is a very fearful situation back at home. So most, most neighbors, Australia included, seem to be working with the federal government and supporting efforts to suppress uh, your opposition in some ways to the, to the one China policy. Basically, they've been engaging with the prime minister, but not with your province or, or you or other officials that are pushing back against China's presence. Is that right? Yes, because uh, what 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 is what was actually the the process at the moment is the 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 other government like in Australia they cannot deal directly with the provincial government. Mm. 
So the only way for the Australian to deal with the people of Solomon is through the, the government to government mm -hmm. procedures. So it would be very difficult, except on things like the NGOs, uh, where they hardly been have the, the good, you know, organizing themselves in the provinces, in the provinces on how they been doing things. So in terms of Australian being helping the provinces, they must come to the national government. Mm -hmm. And very rarely you can see people from these uh, bilateral friends coming to the provinces. Mm. Well, if it's okay with you, I would love to open up the discussion and maybe get some questions from the audience. Yes. Okay. With the tradition we have here at Heritage, we like to keep it an interactive discussion. Looks like we already have a few. So maybe we'll go left to right. Is that right? Yeah, g'day. G'day, Premier Lincoln Parker from Australia. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it's sad to hear that it seems that the Australian government isn't supporting you. And considering that Solomon Islands is such a strategic um, country to the northeast of Australia, um, could certainly, if it fell into Chinese hands, cut off our sea lanes of communication and our trade. Um, considering that um, Australia seems only to be dealing with the Prime Minister Sogavari, um, and that you've recently been ousted from your position as Premier of Mylata, the largest province in the Solomon Islands, simply because you don't support the One China policy, which seems strange uh, to me in a democracy. Um, and, and also that in a democracy that they have postponed a federal election simply because of uh, uh, some sport. Um, I'm wondering, um, and, and, and also lastly, I heard that you are in fear of being arrested when you get back um, from CCP coercion of the federal government. Um, I'm wondering, is the Australian government doing anything at all to assist you, um, whether formally or informally, um, considering that you are uh, one of the last Western allies we seem to have in the Solomons, um, what, if anything, are the Australians doing to help you? Thank you. So far, in terms of the governance in Malaita, where going back to when I was the Premier, uh, the help that has been given to us is to the national government through uh, help like medical treatments. But for me to get a help as a premier from the, the government of Australia uh, or any time that we can talk or they can call me in office that we can discuss issues relating to the belief we have, there's not none, none. Mm -hmm. More questions? Hello, I'm um, Gavin Su from the Atlantic Council, and I have a question regarding um, a previous comment you made about being afraid for your life. Um, so I was, um, so I'm wondering how the Solomon Islands is working to combat um, dis Chinese disinformation, and um, Chinese disinformation does not necessarily have to come from places like Xinhua or the Chinese embassy. And as you mentioned before, there was, um, it can also come from like disinformation within the Solomon Islands, and so like. Um, you mentioned for the Solomon Star, it was um, an article by um, a reporter called Alfred Sasako, and he um, claimed that you were um, behind a U.S.-backed plot conspir um, conspiring to overthrow the government of the prime minister. And so this reporter, Alfred Sasako, of the Solomon Star, also has connections to China. For example, he visited China before and sponsorship from the CCP, as well as CCP-aligned organizations. And so with the, this information environment with CCP-connected journalists working at these um, prominent newspapers, it seems like there's not much done in terms of protecting the information environments. And do you think this is a problem within like 
publications like the Solomon Star or the federal government is in related on this as well. Thank you. Sasako uh, is the editor of the edit of the Solomon Star. It's one of the main uh, news streams, newspapers in the Solomon Islands. And uh, he also has an affiliation with the CCP. So most of the information, uh, like we have seen, the, the way he, he wrote his, his, his news uh, in the media is, is not, it's not neutral. So looking from now that he is with the Medi, the new government of Malaita, uh, who is advising Malita province or uh, new premier, he is also uh, get some advices from the national government, uh, from the CCP, uh, in uh, working together to oust my government from being uh, the premier of the province. So yes, the newspaper Solomon Star has been, you know, the Chinese people has been supporting uh, this newspaper, giving them apparatus like lap uh, laptops and computers, and we believe they've been involving much in that. Uh, that, that, that newspaper in the, in, in, in the Solomon Islands. There are only two newspapers, and one is the one that Chinese P, uh, CCP has been involved much in it. Mm -hmm. Maybe a question over here. Thank you. Two, two quick questions. One, uh, we talked about Australia as a partner, but also um, what do you think about some of the other partners like Japan? Well, how is Japan perceived on the ground? And the other question is, um, a lot of what you're describing happens through bribery, through illegal money. Um, is there a way maybe of tracking illegal money or something like that that would help? Would uh, anti-corruption efforts be helpful in this process? Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, the, the first question is about the Japan. Japan is very. It's the only country that uh, involves many infrastructure, big ones like road and bridges and wharf. But they are very quiet. They're so quiet. So they're doing things in the in the, in the country. They involve in uh, community developments and even the main infrastructures of the country like the roads. But they are so very quiet. They just doing things quietly. Yeah, and. The other question is the money. Yes, with the this is something very difficult for a indigenous Solomon Islander to quickly get in into it, getting how this money comes and how the members of parliament get involved in this corruption. But they did because we have seen uh, the the way uh, they switch and also the extension of the the the, the, the parliament. Election. It's because the 39 members of these members have been paid with the Chinese slash fund. And 39 is two thirds of the parliament of 50. And if you have two thirds on your side, you can change the constitution. So ju just so I heard that correct, you said 39 of the 50 members of the National Assembly are being paid from a Chinese slush fund? Yes. Okay. We have more. It's good. Lots of questions. Dean Baxendale, China Democracy Fund. I've been following uh, Daniel's case for some time now. Um, one of the things that uh, you mentioned about Sasako, he's also the vice president of the China Friendship Association of the Solomon Islands, which mm -hmm. is a United Front operation. Uh, so we just, see just to clarify that again, the editor who is writing articles against you is a member of the China Friendship Association. Yes. Vice President. Vice, Vice President. President. OK. So which we know United Front. Uh, and these operations are but a microcosm as we see it playing out in the Solomon Islands. So for America and the world, uh, watching what's happening in the Sol Solomon Islands, and, and we know about the influence operations in Canada, the United States, and, and Britain, how do you see your battle to su support Malaita, and the people of the Solomon Islands playing out on a global stage because really this is, you know, your democracy is at stake, our democracies are at stake. So how do you see it playing out for yourself in the future? And when you go back to the Solomon Islands, how do you hope to fight back again? Thank you, that's a very good question. Uh, <clears throat> first, 
one of the, the very important things that we need to have is the election. Election is the first number one thing, putting the democratic principles back into order. That is one of the things that people in the, the whole Solomon Islands will see that they have the, still have the democratic rights, the rights that belong to the people, the bedrock of any nation is election. So if we can, if the, the world, those who we share the same principle, can have some kind of a narrative that goes back to the Solomon Islands about the election thing, that will help us so much. Another issue is the court cases that we have filed against the national government. Because these cases are, in my view, is a test case for all of the Pacific region. It's for them to get hold on an elected member for not believing to one China policy and you've been ousted or cancelled your seat from being a member. And if we can prove that, that they lose the case, it's going to be a show for all of the Pacific nations and the Solomon Islands. And that in itself will give the people the direction and the, the thinking that we have seen with our own eyes that these people are not telling the truth because the court case says so. They've lost the case. But unfortunately, and thank you for those who help in, like yourself, in uh, funding the cases back at home. Uh, these cases, you know, is very, very expensive for a local Solomon, an indigenous Solomon Island to, to file in the high court. These lawyers, are, the cost of the cases are very, very expensive. And they are, they are, they are pushing it to an avenue that we cannot foot it, like the court cases. Even if you've got something to, to challenge in court, you will hardly do it because of the court cases are very expensive. So by winning the court cases and by putting the election in, in, in order, and then working from people to people, the three main things I've seen will definitely quickly change the whole situation. Vir a virtual question from the audience submitted from Kimberly Reed. Here's her question. I served as the chairman of the Export-Import Bank of the United States during the Trump administration. National Security Advisor Ambassador Robert O'Brien and I hoped to visit the Solomon Islands in November 2021, but COVID presented some challenges. My export-import tenure ended in 2021. In 2022, news reports indicated that the Solomon Islands government has secured a $66 million loan from China to build 161 mobile communication towers, which will be built and supplied by Chinese telecom giant Huawei. The loan will come from the Export-Import Bank of China, which has offered a 1% interest rate. So, do you need a U.S. Export-Import Bank as part of a whole-of-government approach to help the Solomon Islands buy made-in-the-USA goods and services versus China. Hmm. And let me just add a follow-up, because um, j briefly before we came in here, it sounded as if one of the new, one of the first initiatives taken by the new Malaita premier, so you were ousted, and a new one was brought in this year, and one of the first things he did was to bring in Huawei, to build new towers. Um, how could the US government, to get to the original question, uh, maybe help to counteract some of this activity or at least provide Malaita with alternatives if they choose not to go that route? I think the, uh, because the reason for building the towers when they come to the project, when I was still a premier, they said towers are helpful in terms of health, medical services. You can stay anywhere in the province, even in the highlands of the province, and you can still do operations, like doctors will use this uh, communication to get advice from doctors in Australia and anywhere in the world just to do operations. So they are using medical you know, uh, communication skills uh, to change the mind of the executive government. But I have seen during that time that this is uh, like an, an excuse for them to bring in the towers. We have the telecom towers in the provinces. We have the B Mobile Company towers in the provinces. And I was hoping that they upgrade the towers there. And then the services still will be going under the same service providers. But 
going back to the new government, that is the aim of the national government to, to oust me so that they can put the new government that they easily control over. So now it happens. Mm. So they are getting the engineers from the Chinese engineer to go to the province and find out where the towers to be located when I was out from the premier. So that's their aim. And if the, the US government can step in, in in putting a communication that is much cheaper in the Solomon Islands, or maybe ways that can be cheap to get, because communication back in the Solomon is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And for the government to use China money to build towers and then rent it out to the telecommunication provide service providers, it would be add on to the price of the service for customers. So I, I blocked those 24 towers. I see. Uh, we've got a few more in the audience, and I understand one more online. Just one more question. Oh, OK. Sorry. One time for one more question, period. Um, Thanks very much for your time. It's been really interesting listening to you. Um, I wondered, what do you think China's end game is for the Solomon Islands? Is it ultimately to try and build a military facility there? What's the, what's the end game? And also, can I ask, um, what do you hear uh, about other countries in the Pacific and the influence China has on them? Good question. Actually, Kathy, Andrew, did you have a question as well? Maybe we could take two for one uh, as a final. Uh, Your Honor, um, we've seen other countries which are heavily in debt. We've got a mic for you. Your Honor, we've seen other countries which are heavily in debt via the Belt and Road projects, how they've changed their constitutions at the behest of the PRC regime. For example, last year, Barbados changed its constitution and changed its ceremonial head of state. When do you see the same thing happening uh, in the Solomon Islands at the behest of China? Uh, could you rephrase that, maybe? Uh, sort of the way. Uh, <coughs> Barbados last year yeah. had a, changed their head of state without a referendum and removed King, uh, then Queen Elizabeth II as their head of state. How soon before King Charles III is removed as the head of state of, of the Solomon Islands at the behest of China? Mm. Yeah. Well, let's take the first one first. Okay. So what, what's China's long-term game plan? What, what's the end game? If China were to get everything it wanted, what would that look like in the Solomon Islands? What do you think is their end goal? With the military thing, uh, they've been tried once in the past with the Sam Group, group company trying to get the base in Tulagi, where the British uh, capital used to be before. But uh, people start to, you know, find out the background of that investment in Tulagi, that that some group uh, somehow belongs to the PLA. Mm -hmm. So uh, in my view, whatever they try to, whatever way they try to, to get into the country by using so many different developments, uh, what is in the, the back of their mind uh, maybe sometimes happen. Maybe in military, I don't know, but we can see that the way they start putting in uh, vehicles, riot vehicles and riot gears and trainings in the country, it seems to, to show us the beginning of things like that. Hmm. So I've been seeing that if we don't have uh, careful, we will end up like the Uyghurs. Hmm. Uh, we have been to the Uyghurs community here, and the way they talked about how China come into uh, their place is exactly the same as what is happening in the Solomon right now. Mm. So they talk about infrastructures, good things, win-win situations, and now they end up that way. So Solomon Islands, too, are now going in the same trend of, you know, <coughs> ways. The Chinese come in our country, now they start to adopt our culture, they go and give uh, sell money to the people in Mali, the province, as though this sell money giving is their culture. So they, I've seen that they are they're creeping in through our culture. And very shortly, if we are not careful about, uh, they will be looking after the whole of Solomon Islands with the way they think they will gain their, their aims and objectives. Hmm. Your timing is perfect. 
we had a hard stop at a 11.45, and I think uh, we frankly covered a lot of ground just in our short conversation. You've done a tremendous job educating us about what's happening in your country and in your province. Um, it is absolutely vital for us to hear from you uh, what's happening there because uh, unfortunately the Pacific Islands have been, a, a, I think, a blind spot for the United States for too long. Um, and so I wanna thank the audience for coming out on a rainy day and attending in person. I wanna thank you for uh, making this trip and for bravely fighting for democratic principles in your country and for your people at great risk to yourself. And I think it's very admirable what you've done. I, I wish you luck in the rest of your journey here uh, in Washington. I hope you're able to educate US lawmakers and diplomats and other officials on what's taking place. And finally, a message to the US government, the Solomon Islands government and the Chinese government will be watching uh, what happens in the weeks and months ahead and will be raising awareness about it. So thank you, Mr. Sudani. Thank you as well.